Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Berman, the host of the Cyber Hero Adventures show. Today, we have a special show focusing on the difficult and unfortunate circumstances that are happening right now um, between uh, Russia and Ukraine and the rest of the world. Um, your, the, my audience knows that generally I try to keep a little bit more of a lighter, uh, fun uh, approach to our show. However, this uh, just doesn't uh, lend itself to that, given the uh, life and death uh, matters that are at stake. Uh, We're really, really fortunate to have uh, two subject matter experts uh, with us, uh, Dr. Chase uh, Cunningham. Uh, Chase is the author of an uh, amazing book about uh, cyber warfare, which he'll uh, tell us about in just a few minutes. And I've had the uh, privilege of listening and learning from uh, Chase for uh, a couple of uh, years now, and uh, he's a uh, real-life uh, unsung cyber hero. So, uh, Chase, uh, if you can unmute, uh, we'll have you uh, welcome to the show. How you doing? Hey, yeah, uh, thanks for having me on again. Yeah, indeed. Um, it, it's really fortunate that we have you and unfortunate that we need you, you know, because we're actually in, in the midst of uh, the potential of uh, cyber warfare and and uh, speaking of uh, fortunate uh, people uh, in our digital universe, um, this is Mike Jones. Uh, Mike Jones uh, has also been a friend uh, for uh, several years and is uh, a true unsung uh, cyber hero doing rather amazing stuff, um, you know, behind the scenes and, and um, often in an anonymous uh, sort of way, which we'll uh, come back to in a little bit. So, um, uh, hey, Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Pleasure. It's good to see you, Chase. Yeah, man. <laughs> In, indeed. And um, so just to uh, set the table, uh, here's an interesting uh, graphic uh, that I uh, came about, which, um, you know, everyone uh, is probably known about. And uh, that's uh, some of the challenges uh, uh, associated with uh, the digital universe and um, and defending uh, our nation's critical infrastructure. So, uh, Chase, uh, for those uh, of our audience who may not uh, know you, uh, would you be kind enough just to give us a little bit of your origin story, you know, how you got to, to this moment? Uh, sure. So I'm retired Navy. Uh, I was a cryptologist chief, um, did a bunch of work for the government after that, different three letter agencies, and then uh, worked at Forrester Research for a few years and then transitioned over to uh, working at uh, Aericom Software now. Indeed. And uh, without going into anything uh, too confidential, uh, can you give our audience a sense of the kind of of missions that, that you embark on? Uh, well, now I do a lot of advisory work and things like that. But um, back in the day, I, I helped write the curriculum for the computer network exploitation program at Fort Meade. And then I did a bunch of um, work in the space around uh, C and E, C and D, C and A. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, and uh, Mike, uh, can you share with us a little bit about uh, your rather fascinating origin story as well? Sure. Um, my career started out a lot like uh, Chase's. I was a cryptologist in the Navy as well. Um, and later on becoming that, that new rate that, that Chase uh, wrote the books for, the CTN rate, um, doing network attack and defend. And then later on left and went over to the dark side for a little bit and worked uh, with hacktivists and, and um, other things like that. And now I'm working uh, as a manager for an MDR and writing short films for Alyssa Knight and continuing speaking and, and mentoring uh, previous offenders. You know, I, I want to start with the last thing that you just said there uh, first about mentoring a previous offenders. You know, when you first uh, told me about that, I said that is just an amazingly uh, wonderful mission. Can you just share with our audience a little bit about that? Sure. I work with uh, law enforcement, mostly from England uh, right now. I'm actually mentoring a guy that just recently got out of prison um, from a really high profile hack. Uh, I'm working with his probation officer and, and kind of giving him things to, you know, look into research and learn uh, and try to help him get through his probationary period and get him back into cybersecurity and, uh, you know, as a contributing, contributing individual into, into the industry. Indeed, and, and it really aligns with something uh, that I've listened and learned from uh, pertaining to CISA. We've had the opportunity to work uh, closely with them. And one of the missions that the new leadership of um, CISA is, is embarked on is to kind of meet, you know, people where they are, you know, whether they're, you know, hackers, to use air quotes of that or whatever. And, you know, because it's very important to, to convince 
and everyone of the importance of, of defending uh, our country and being um, uh, sort of on the good side of things. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a big uh, it's a big effort. Um, and I'm glad to see that people are actually embracing people with that type of skill set uh, in a more open way instead of, you know, going through the bat channels and stuff like that to, to get that help. Indeed. Um, so, Chase, let's jump into the matter at hand, um, you know, Russia and um, Ukraine and the rest of the world and and cyber warfare. Can you uh, set the table for us by simply defining what cyber warfare is and the way you experience it? Let's start with that. Well, I think cyber warfare to me is 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 the evolution of first strike capabilities. I mean, really, where we've and we've already seen this, that. Uh, um, the first thing that was kind of noted was, you know, sort of an escalation of um, DDoSs and malware-based attacks and ransomware events and um, websites going down, those types of things. And that happened even before um, conventional forces started crossing borders over there. Uh, and that, I mean, that, that in my opinion, is really where the nature of warfare has evolved to, where cyber is the first strike capability. Um, it's it's the bridge between clandestine covert espionage and kinetic operations. And this is, um, this is the first real use case, I guess you could say we've seen at this scale of an actual transition from failed diplomacy to escalations of espionage activities to full on cyber operations to kinetic strike. Indeed, and, and it's a really apt metaphor, you know, this bridge between the, the two, uh, you know, digital versus kinetic warfare. Um, what is your opinion about um, people crossing that bridge, whether it be Russians or Americans or someone else? Well, I mean, I remind people all the time that there are there's no Geneva Conventions in cyber. There's no rules of engagement um, there. It honestly, it scares the hell out of me just when I've been reading it about stuff lately, because I'm glad that there are people getting involved that are doing the things that we need them to do and, and are trying to help um, bring the fight to the enemy here. However, uh, there is a real concern around whether or not you stumble into something that could potentially kick off a larger kinetic activity. And, you know, I, 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 this is already a, a horrible human crisis. I would, I would be um, absolutely uh, terrified if this moved into a phase where someone accidentally stepped on something digitally that caused a larger loss of life. And it, every time I see something going on, it's it's a little bit more of like, a, that, be really careful, folks. Like, really, really careful. And um, if you don't know what you're doing, don't get involved here. Find another way to contribute. Donate money, something like that. Yeah, I mean that's an incredibly important insight, which you know I, uh, I think Mike, you're you're uniquely qualified to opine on. Uh, it was a lot of public information uh, about, for example, uh, a hacktivist group, uh, Anonymous, um, has launched a series of allegedly. Uh, launched, uh, you know, a, a series of attacks. What What is your your view on that? To build on on what Chase is saying, this is a very legitimate, um, unintentional consequences. Yeah, well, I, I think that you know, Anonymous has done this throughout the throughout the history of the group. Um, looked out for the people uh, in countries that are being oppressed uh, and and during conflicts like that. And usually, their their mo is is denial of service or taking down websites or or critical services for those websites. They don't usually go outside those bounds, um, but I, I, I completely agree with Chase is that the more people that get involved with that electronic warfare, um, you know, Russia is not going to respond with, uh, you know, don't don't do that again. As far as hitting a critical infrastructure, they will absolutely launch something. Um, and that's the fear that I have as well. Um, but I do want to clarify one thing. You know, I do have um, interest on both sides of the Ukraine and Russia, and it's not it's not the Russian people. And I, I just want people to understand that when you say, you know, the Russians or, you know, when you make that type of comment, um, the people, it's a communist country. They have absolutely no say in what their government does. And, you know, I just want people to be aware that the Russian people are not for this either. Um, you know, it's very upsetting to see what's going on there. I really appreciate that clarification for our audience as well. And thank you for that, you know, because you to build on what you're saying is is uh, kind of an illustration of it are all the protests uh, you know, that you actually see in Russia and 
and the Russians who uh, are protesting know uh, that they're going to jail um, and that there are significant uh, consequences, which I think as an outside uh, uh, a person in a free country, we can sit here and say anything we want. Um, I, I wonder if we just take that for granted. Yeah, I think I think we do. Um, but also it's a cultural thing. And people understand that, that when you go against the government in a communist country like that, the consequences are not small. Um, and I, I think that we need to understand that the people of the Ukraine and Russia both need our help somehow. Yeah. And uh, Chase, you said something really interesting earlier uh, pertaining to a, there are no rules of engagement. Um, What's going to happen? Well, that's why I say it, 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 it worries me because, you know, we have people rushing into the fight that are, you know, like they're trying to do what they think is right. And, you know, again, donate money, volunteer, contribute, that type of stuff. Engaging in cyber conflict operations is a very dangerous place to be. Um, and it, there is so much. Uh, I did some looking around this morning and I won't go into specifics, but. There was like 85,000 potential avenues that, if you know what you're doing, could have caused some real detriment to valuable infrastructure in certain regions. That's as far as I'm going to say. Um, and if you know what you're doing, you can, you know, do things. But if you don't know what you're doing and you go in there and start poking and prodding around, um, you could uh, unintentionally cause loss of life or, like Mike was saying, escalations in force. And I mean, luckily today, while I don't think it was productive, it looks like the Ukrainians and the Russians at least sat down at the table and had some sort of conversation. So that's something. Um, but yeah, it's uh, and there's, you know, having been in the military, right, there's rules of engagement when you're engaged in conflict. In cyber, there are none. Um, I don't have to wait for you to shoot at me to shoot back. I don't have to ignore, you know, a, a, a vital, critical piece of infrastructure. If it's available and I have the capabilities, What's to stop me? Yeah, indeed. Uh, Mike, you want to add to that thought? Yeah, I just, you know, Chase was talking about, you know, hitting the wrong type of uh, target and not really knowing what you're doing. Um, that is a, is a big fear because I, th I think uh, Putin and his regime are, are very, uh, at the end of the rope, I think they're very desperate right now. Yeah. And just a small conflict like that could turn this into a very dangerous situation for the entire world, not just, you know, the Ukraine, you know, talking about thermobaric weapons and regional nukes and stuff. That's not a game that we want to play with um, because it's obvious that the U S government is not going to put boots on the ground um, to help these people. And so I think we need to keep the risk to a minimum because, you know, there's a lot of lives at stake and there's a lot of things that can happen globally off of this, uh, this issue I mean, look at China and the way China is watching us uh, conduct this with, you know, Russia and the Ukraine. We make one false move or one mistake where someone gets involved that shouldn't be involved and it could turn out to be a global, global skill issue. I mean, this is a, if you're China, this is a great learning exercise for how to invade Taiwan. Absolutely. 100%. I guarantee you there people are sitting there with grease pens on marker boards right now going, OK, well, they did this. This would be how we'd approach the problem. Like. The flow chart from hell is being built right now in mainland China. Yeah, it's sad too because like last November I was on a tech strong event and it was called Predict 22. And the predictions that I laid out, you know, ransomware as a weapon being used in geopolitical situations that came true like in January. Um, and a lot of things that, that I was looking at, you know, with China, I, one of the things I said was Russia and, and Ukraine are going to have some issues, be geopolitical tensions all over the world. But China's going to watch this. And they're going to see what we're doing. And if we don't handle this the correct way, guess what? We have part two coming in Taiwan. What, and, and maybe you can expand on that. What, what would the correct way be? How, how do we uh, model the right behaviors, you know, with perhaps the goal of, of establishing some type of rules of engagement to avoid escalation of these types of conflicts? You, you can't, you can't I'm not qualified to answer that. <laughs> I'm not a politician. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I'm not qualified either, but I can tell you it's hard to create conditions and rules of engagement with a madman. It's just, it's impossible. 
Well, um, so uh, drilling down a little bit further into the, the technology, the cybersecurity aspect, you know, that one of the challenges is attribution, you know, um, and false positive. Um, do you envision that there might be uh, other nation states, you know, besides, you know, that you mentioned China and Russia, like looking to, or, or criminal gangs or, or things, you know, looking to, you know, uh, create these false flags, uh, you know, in cyberspace? It's the wild, wild west. I mean, <laughs> it's the wild, wild west on meth right now. I mean, that's, you know, really wow. what, yeah. Um, you know, and that's, that's again, why I say, I mean, Article 5 of the NATO treaty says, right, if you attack one, you attack all. So my, my worst fear, honestly, right now, and I think it's a valid one, is somebody's doing something, they jump through a box inside of mainland Russia, pipe out to somewhere else, someone in NATO goes, oh, that's an attack on us, now that's an attack on all, and we have meteoric escalation, even though it wasn't a valid thing. And that, I mean, that's the type of deal when we talk about in cyber warfare. Um, number one, I always tell people, I think attribution in 99.997% of things is suspect if best. Um, but here, if that type of thing does occur, you're looking at potentially, you know, significant um, fallout. Yeah. And what do they say? The, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, you know, and you look at the cyber, the cyber uh, theater and that, I think that would play into uh, effect quite a bit. Um, it's an opportunity and hackers and, and most uh, groups are opportunists. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and so Chase, you know, in, in creating your book, um, you know, you, you contemplated situations like this. I mean, it's the basis of it. Um, is it so far playing out the way you had thought or are you seeing? Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I, there's a chapter at the end of the book where I went through a whole scenario on what a cyber you know, espionage to cyber to kinetic warfare all looked like. And it's, I mean, I, I could have drawn it on the board and said like, there it is. Um, and it's not, I, I hate to be an armchair quarterback, but it's just one of those things of this is what we do. So we know what we're, you know, theoretically anyway, we know what we're talking about. Um, and it uh, it continues to prove right. I mean, the only thing that we haven't seen yet, honestly, is the the use of um, deep fakes and those types of things to manipulate the narrative, which I think is coming. Um, and but we have seen the manipulation of narratives at scale to spread false information. You know, so it's a. Uh, um, I mean, it's a playbook. You could you know you could put this stuff in and just shovel cards at people, and it'd be the same thing every time. Wow. And that, boy, that's an unsettling thought. And for those of us in our audience who may not be familiar with deep fakes, uh, which I think, you know, most everyone is, but just um, maybe, uh, you know, Mike, can you just uh, add on that a little bit? Sure. It's like the psyops and propaganda um, campaigns during earlier conflicts, but escalated to a digital form where, you know, deep fake, they could have like, you know, Putin making a statement uh, against the world. Um, but actually they've used old video and used some computer graphics and, and used some, some audio to mix it in to make it look believable. Um, and that's, that's a dangerous situation. But, you know, just and I want to comment on this really quick. When you talk about, you know, propaganda and stuff like that, all sides play that game. If you watch Russian news, if you watch Ukrainian news and you watch U.S. news, you'll get three different stories. Um, so if you're watching news, be careful what you listen to and what you buy 100 percent. Maybe get, you know, the other side's version of it, too, because the truth is somewhere in the middle of that triangle. Indeed. And, and, and so, you know, in terms of uh, America's role in cyberspace, I mean, one of the things that, uh, and please correct me if this is uh, incorrect or incomplete, one of the things I've come to understand is that if you launch uh, some type of forward attack, a cyber attack, if, if, if we do, if American uh, does, um, that um, the enemy, whoever that might be, uh, has the code uh, of the attack, can that be just used or um, you know re uh, engineered reverse engineered, you know, to to harm us? Um, sort of. So, like, if you're if you're talking about ransomware, absolutely, um, we've seen a lot of that. But an actual like exploit, uh, the chances of us being able to get the code on the other end of that exploit depends on how the exploit runs and, and what services or what type of uh, technology it goes after. 
um, because at that point you're left with log files. Uh, but in the case of ransomware, absolutely. I mean, we've looked at, at different uh, ransomware packages like Conti and some of the others and some of the wipers that they've used during the conflict. And yeah, we can absolutely get that code, but it's pretty common co code. Uh, I think what's more important is looking at our own um, open holes and, and issues we have in our own infrastructure more than tracing back the code of, of the uh, offender. Well, uh, speaking of, you know, the infrastructure, you know, one of the most um, obvious sort of attack vectors um, would be, you know, energy, the, the, the power grid, things like that. Chase, what's your assessment, if you can say publicly, about, um, you know, America's um, energy uh, infrastructure, grid, the grid, things like that? Uh, it's an absolute shenanigan show. The easiest way to put it, um, you know, just looking at just looking at like one thing since we're on the call here and um, it's worth doing it really quickly. Let's just go because I heard there was a new vulnerability in this particular piece of architecture. I see right now. 57,487, actually in the U.S. alone, 15,747 that are up and operational right now this second that have industrial control system configuration checks running on them that are talking to a vulnerable piece of software, which is open to the Internet. Um, All right. Uh, my, my head is just exploding here. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I, I don't even know what to say to that. I like, except, oh my God, or something, or maybe I'll pop in a graphic going like, ouch, you know, but um, that that's incredible. And how fast, can you tell our audience um, how you got that information or is that something you don't? Nope. Okay. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I, I believe you, <laughs> you know, that's for sure. I mean, believe it or not, it is what it is. Like it's, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it's uh uh, that and uh, that's that's looking at one piece of vulnerable software on one particular configuration than an industrial control system setting fifteen thousand seven hundred forty seven. If you know what you're looking for and know where to go get it. And meaning, meaning. Um, now, does that mean that all fifteen thousand of those are potentially ownable? Not necessarily. Does that mean that of fifteen thousand, let's say three percent? Five percent are do the math that's still a pretty large and then the other issue that you run into is if i can get into three percent of fifteen thousand what is behind what i get into within that and then because of the way systems are configured i can just crawl through the web of the internal side of it and what else will i find and it just becomes you know a, a, a and this is why like I, i'm a huge fan of all the folks at CISA. i love what they do and i think jen easterly and those folks and chris ingles are amazing individuals However, what bothers me as a, a cyber warfare person is we say things like shields up, which is great. Absolutely. However, comma, we should have a program running with federal dollars behind it to look for a vulnerable system on the Internet. And if it's out there for X number of days, whatever that agreement comes to, we either patch it or you take it offline. And if you do that, you massively increase our protect, our protect space. Right now, there is no requirement for that. You go send a tweet, shields up. Great. Like whatever. Well, this is a really important point, uh, not that, and and I've heard this, you know, uh, before as well. Um, so, uh, the the challenge it seems is that the criminals, uh, the nation states, are uh, horizontally sort of organized. They share information and and technologies and best practices uh, more or less freely compared to you know the defenders who are vertically structured and constrained by law. Um, by intellectual property, by competition and other sort of constraints and things like that. So the optimal way from what I understand, let me just check to see what you all think about this, um, is these public-private partnerships, you know, because we need, you know, a whole of government approach, right? Um, if I could quickly, because I know Mike said something to say, but I think that that's a lot of cop-out and that's a lot of blame game going around, which is typical government. We, we allocated $10.4 billion last year in our budget for cybersecurity. This is not a $10 billion problem. If someone said, Chase, here's $3 million, go run this program and patch infrastructure, I could do it today. And it's wow. all you need is the authority and the actual go ahead to do it now. That would require from on high to say this is going to happen. There would be some other legislative things that have to occur. But we haven't had that approach. And the problem is this is 
the perfect scenario of we continue to treat the symptoms and not cure the disease because we have an industry that's created to do so. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it is what it is. I put out a thing this morning saying if antivirus stop ransomware, ransomware would and I already got a whole bunch of hate mail about it. I don't care, but I'm not wrong. And, and just to fill, and Mike, we'll come to you just one more second. Um, so just to fill that out, um, you know, further, um, I, I understand the order of magnitude when you say like $3 million. To- I don't even, that, that's just a number I picked out of the air. It could be. Oh, I, no, could I, I, I know. I, I understand the, the magnitude of that versus, you know, 10 billion or whatever, but it's a question of political will. Are you seeing um, that there is, because of cyber cyber attacks are just so um, prevalent and across everything, are, are you seeing the political will beginning to shift towards the kind of solution that you just put forth? You will now. <laughs> I mean, That's you will that. now. We, we haven't had this type of thing happen yet. And there's been those of us that have been saying this is coming and people kept hemming and hawing and moaning and saying that that wasn't really a thing. Now it is. And there are people that ha- they are way smarter than either of us that have got, you know, play in this space that can make things happen. My my humble prayer is that that does happen following this conflict, because we the next time you don't get that many passes where bad things don't happen right off the bat, especially in conflict. Yeah, indeed. Um, and, and I and I would just opine, I, I don't think it's a question of being smarter than you. I think they might just have different skill sets or different missions, but they're not not smarter than the two of you. I can attest to that. Um, Mike, you wanted to add to that? Sure. So the, the connection between, you know, the government and the public sector, you know, it, it, here's the problem I have is it's never a two way street. Um, take the FBI InfraGuard for one. Uh, you know, they're really good at collecting information from the industry, but not very good at, at redisseminating stuff back to the industry where they need to. Uh, I think that's always been a problem. I think that'll always be a problem, um, you know, until, you know, we get a better system. Yeah. And when it comes to, you know, being able to find these these devices and these systems that are that are wide open, that's a problem, you know, and Chase, I'm sure, is looking at a, a, a classified system. But then you have places like Shodan where I can just go and jump in and pull out data from ICS and, and systems like that all across the world and just make a target list. Um, you know, it's it's gotten to the point where cyber warfare, I believe, is always going to be the first initiating factor from now on. Um, and, you know, you look at some of the ways that the Navy in general is, is transitioning into a more modern warfare type of uh, scenario. You know, we have drone destroyers out there. We have UAVs. We have everything that can be controlled remotely. Um, and I've been saying this for, for years that this is going to become an autonomous type of battlefield at some point. You'll have, your, you'll have your boots on the ground at some point. But, you know, why spend lives when you don't have to? Uh, but, you know, as far as the, the conflict, the conflict goes right now, you know, the, the transition from ransomware as a way for thugs to make money uh, turned over to becoming a, a weapon, uh, I think, was a natural transition. And it was bound to happen at some point. Indeed. And well, as we're uh, wrapping up here, um, you have some final thoughts, uh, Chase. How, how do people get a copy of your book? Uh, it's on Amazon. Just look for cyber warfare. There's not a whole lot of uh, people that took the time out to write about cyber warfare. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, I, I mean, I would say fortunately and unfortunately, I, I hope that we help you, you know, spread the word by selling more books. But even though I know that's not your, uh, your well, I'll tell you right now on the on the call, any any re- any profits or revenue that I make for the next two quarters on that book are going to be donated to the Ukrainian effort. So. Good for you, and and it's very inspiring. And let me think what the Cyber Hero Network can do um, in support, uh, other than what we're doing at this moment. Yeah, there's uh, there's refugees that need stuff, and if I can give them some money from a book I wrote, then amazing. I'll do that every day, all day, twice on Sunday. Thank you for that, uh, Mike. Uh, any uh, last words? Uh, you know, just be nice to each other and don't allow this whole conflict to become something like world war ii or rounding up uh, japanese americans into camps um let's not turn this into a russian prejudice uh you know keystone you know those people are pretty innocent when it comes to what their government's doing 
Indeed. Well, on behalf of a grateful digital universe, uh, thanks to uh, Mike Jones and Ch uh, Chase Cunningham for being real life unsung cyber heroes. Um, it's why we exist. Um, and uh, you know, I just want to make sure the audience and world knows that there are way more good people than there are bad people in the world. They just don't get the publicity. And that's why we exist. Um, and so thank you so much for, for who you are and what you do and why you do it. Well, by, by the way, just for clarity's sake, I'm not looking at a classified system on a uh, public network. I don't want anybody sending the FBI to my house since Mike mentioned it. It's just a query. you got to know the right ways to pipe it and which answers you're looking for. So FBI, if you hear this, don't come knock on my door. Not a classified system. It's a yellow network. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, TLP, I guess. Um, so, um, well, you just blew my head again. I mean, I, I, I'm going to just say something personally. I, you know, I've known you guys for a while, and and you just live heard why I call myself the Forrest Gump of cybersecurity because I just bump into the most extraordinary moments of which this is one. So, anyways, uh, again, on behalf of a grateful digital universe, thanks so much for everything you all do and how you go about doing it, and uh, uh, keep it up. We need you. Cool.